we are live now uh, good evening everybody uh, welcome again to this evening's webinar brought to you from the orthopedic research and education foundation today we have the pleasure of once again having professor ak pal from kolkata and he's going to talk to about the oski examination i think as you all are aware today the oski examination has become an essential part of the dnb examination and uh, apparently the questions can be very difficult at times so you need to know how to go about uh, firstly understanding the questions and then knowing what are the important aspects of the answer that you need to give so i, I think there can be no better person than professor pal uh, to enlighten us on this so over to you dr pal yes good evening dr john mukhopadhyay uh, thank you very much for this uh, class uh, so basically this is also learning this is a dynamic process as we are also learning how to uh, teach how to teach the, our students how to instruct our students uh, for uh, crack the to crack the oski because oski is basically is, is, a, is a mainstay of the dnb examination and is now going to become a very little bit uh, harder day by day and so we have first of all we have to understand what is the uh, what is the actual uh, questions is asked in the uh, in the oski examination some oskis are very uh, easier i will show you and some uh, questions will be little bit difficult so it is very uh, we, we have to understand this art of uh, making the, the oski how to crack the oski just to understand what is the uh, this basically it is required and what is the basic uh, management so suppose this is the oski so one uh, uh, oski was given there is a uh, that the baby is uh, running in a uh, in a crawling manner so the oski is what which gait it is so baby is walking like this so is it a normal uh, crawling or is abnormal craw craw uh, crawling basically it is a crawling gait so before uh, baby learns to stand and walk so once there's uh, she she or he starts crawling so this is known as a crawling gait so which grade it is it is the answer is a crawling gait now uh, the cause why it is important crawling basically it may be symmetrical and asymmetrical so suppose this is the this was the uh, mode of questions like which gait it is what is the cause of uh, this uh, this sort of is a normal or abnormal basically it is a no, abnormal gait so what is the cause of abnormal which disease is underlying you know what is the importance of recognition what is the ideal age for prevention and the treatment so these are this sort of questions is very asked now i am going one by one so basically it is a crawling gait so once the baby starts sitting so what is the basic uh, milestone so baby starts uh, just uh, to elevate his uh, head, neck head and neck and that is uh, that is from 3 months onwards 6 months is the ideal age for sitting and the 9 months that is stand with support and 1 year is just with, without stand without support so from 6 months onwards baby tries to crawl when he sit learns to sit so for six weeks to now six months to nine months or a one year so basically basically it is that time when the baby tries to crawl now the crawling gait basically it may be ideal it should be symmetrical crawling so what is that basically the, the baby use the hands and knees with equal distance suppose this is the normal gait as you can see here so this is the normal distance between the uh, the, the, the the both the knee and the both the hip is equal so this is a symmetrical crawling. Now uh, these are the lower figure. Basically, this is a asymmetrical crawling, as abnormal crawling. As you can see here, this one leg is outside. It is a, and another. This is when, instead of the knee, the the, in, the basically they crawls with baby crawls with the knees and the and the hands. But here instead of the knee, the baby crawls with the hands and the feet. So these are the asymmetrical or abnormal crawling. So what is the sign of development of the motor? So basically, this crawling is the sign of the development of the motor and skill, and it may be symmetrical and asymmetrical. Another uh, word is known as a scooting, where this is a Peter patient, uh, the, the baby predominantly walks on one leg. So for mobility. So what is the abnormal? What is the uh, abnormal uh, crawling? Asymmetrical crawling. So that is a, that, uh, that that basically the cause underlying is the improper muscle development. It may be curved spine or scoliosis. There is shifted pelvis or abnormal uh, pelvis alignment or the hip girdle. There is visual orientation issues and issues of the with body awareness and the balance when learning to walk. Basically, what are the causes? It may be there is an early feature of the autism, or it may be cerebral palsy, or it may be a feature of the hip dysplasia or the pelvic deformity, or it is a scoliosis or the vision issues. 
So how to understand for that? So there are different types of asymmetrical crawling, as you can see here, club crawling, hitch crawling, gear crawling, grab crawling like that. So I'm just uh, from the orthopedic point of view. So these are the most important. That is a hitch crawl, which as you can see here, one leg is outside. Basically, both the, the, the knee, the knee level should be just below the hip level. This is the ideal. But here, the knee, knee, knee level is outside the level of the hip joint. That is known as the hitch crawl. Or this is a, you see, this is the one-legged crawl. Patient is crawling almost it's one leg, another leg is outside. So if it's a hitch crawl, basically it is due to imbalance of the pelvis. The pelvis is uh, some abnormal, uh, that's some uh, fixed pelvic obliquity or it is due to uh, scoliosis. Or if it is a one-legged crawl like this, so basically it is a scooting or it may be, it, it is maybe feature of the DGH. So if the, why it is important? Because if we understand the, the this sort of abnormal crawling may be a feature of the uh, diseases that can be easily, we can uh, um, identify it. And we, if we treat it item from very early, we can prevent it. Now, this is also the, another is known as a beer, beer crawling, where instead of the both the knee and the hand, baby uh, crawls with both the hands and the feet. So this is the beer crawling and the crab crawling is basically, this is almost another form of uh, beer crawling, where the, both the, uh, the lower limbs are relatively little bit outside than the, the this is widely apart, widely apart instead of the not the equal, this the sizes may be unequal and this is the both the hands and the both the legs are widely apart. So these are the all abnormal crawling and basically it is due to cerebral palsy. Uh, so these are the sign of the cerebral palsy. So from an orthopedic point of view, this sort of abnormal crawling should be uh, should be very much um, uh, important. And if we identify the cases earlier, so it is very easy to di diagnose. Basically what happens in cerebral palsy, as the baby is very small, they are they, it is very difficult to understand the patients are spastic. So yeah, basically, it four years is required to understand that basically the babies are very spastic. <clears throat> and uh, basically once the uh, spasticity is maximum, so spasticity gradually increases up to four years and gradually decreases up to 12 years. So once it is at this height of uh, spasticity, then that is the stage where the baby is uh, diagnosed as a spastic baby. Now there is a lots of uh, time has become passed. And the prognosis basically for the independent locomotion is favorable. Sometimes it is asked, what is the better prognosis? For the independent walking or independent uh, lifestyle, whether it, 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 your baby will attain or not. Basically, the prognosis for independent locomotion is favorable if the child learns sitting within two years. This is extremely important. <clears throat> and spasticity, what is the importance of that? If we identify the spasticity earlier, so that will that will prevent the joint contracture because if the in the both side of the joint is uh, so one side is spastic. The spasticity leads to shortening of the muscles on that side, whereas in the other on the other side the muscles are elongated. So in spite of the, the other side becomes normal, as the muscle is elongated, they become very much weaker. So that is the that is the basic problem. So on the other side, if the spasticity is contra it remains for a long time, so that the, the length becomes completely uh, is reduced, and that may lead to contraction. So ultimately, spasticity is converted to contraction. So spasticity is basically is reversible. When it becomes to contracture, that is irreversible. That is why it is very important to diagnose in a crawling stage. So, uh, so what are the causes? Basically, these are the uh, in usually uh, the points we have. Uh, we have very much important for our clinical uh, diagnosis. So we have to identify this spasticity by hyperreflexia, by increasing tone, um, and uh, so and the reflex. And athetoid is there is some uh, dancing, some abnormal, bizarre movement. And ataxic basically is a weakness. So identify the where the muscles, which are you know, basically the two joint muscles, like the flexor adductors of the of the hip. The answer is the rectus femoris, hamstring, and the gastrocnemius. So these are the muscles usually affected. We have to identify which muscles is in involved. We have to identify this spasticity and contracture by the R1 and R2. That is, the, it is a velocity dependent. So if we suddenly stretch it, say there is a fast, uh, fast halt. Fast halt is the R1. That is, it is due to the spasticity. If we may, if we make makes uh, sustained pressure, that will ultimately completely may become uh, completely may become corrected. And that is basically the spasticity. But if it is contracture, so that that is ultimately the, this R1 is R2 equal to it should be equal. So that is the R1 and R2 by which we can easily diagnose between the uh, spasticity and the contracture. 
And there is a two important uh, parameters. There is one is a, that is a gross motor function uh, score. There is a GMFC score, which is a basically detects the functional status, whether the patient is become independent ultimately by giving some treatment or not. And there is the assured scale, which is uh, used for assessing the tone, by which we can easily have uh, making the planning of the treatment. So that another question is asked in that uh, question, it's a more than time limit of the treatment. So, uh, so ideal age for treatment is a reduction of the specificity that should be started at least within four years. So basically this is very, very important, but this treatment is um, uh, should be started at a certain limit when the, there is a, uh, the control of the head has become already um, attained or the patient has uh, relatively late, uh, gained some, some amount of balance and equilibrium. This is most important. Uh, so as the patient uh, this, uh, this is doesn't have, is the, if the patient doesn't attain this sort of criteria, so just uh, giving some traction, some, some giving some medications, it is very difficult to uh, revert back the spasticity. So the, the, that is the age, ideal age of treatment should be started at least within four years. This is very important. Mm, by what are the, uh, the, the different, different modalities? Like the passive stretching, manipulation, tone inhibiting cast, orthosis, myoneural block, intrathecal baclofen, or the selective dorsal rhizotomy. If these all fails, then the surgical treatment should be started. So the ideal time should be five to seven years. These are the usual question is asked in this uh, OSCE. Now, what are the different types of uh, surgery? That's basically surgery is done for deformity of the unstable joint. And that is basically two types of surgery is done. That is either it is a weakening of the spastic or contracted muscle or the strengthening of the weak muscles. So basically this is the first option, this weakening of the spastic or contracted muscles that can be done by release of the musculotendinous junction or elongation instead of cutting completely the muscles or elongation, because if we cut the muscles, because the muscle is already weak, so that can cause further weakness, that, we, uh, that can cause opposite treatment deformity. So complete uh, correction is not easily uh, recommended. So that can be done by incomplete uh, correction. And ultimately the rest of the correction can be done with the help of some conservative management. Now another, uh, the inferior option is the strengthening of the weak muscles. That is the, the weaker side, on the weaker side of the joint, the, the spastic muscles from the other side that can be transferred. But this is very difficult when sometimes because opposite deformity. So that is to be done very, very cautiously. So these are the uh, usual treatment options usually done in case of uh, uh, cerebral palsy. <clears throat> but if there is a huge type of crawling, so that means there is some uh, possibility of deep, uh, DGH. So how do you manage this case? So we have to uh, check the hip abduction. So basically, this is the protocol. So you have to the hip, uh, hip maybe hip abduction is restricted or maybe uh, normal. So if it is a hip abduction is restricted, then you have to do the autolani test. If it is a positive autolani test, that means it is uh, it is dislocated, that is unreducible. So we have to uh, start immediate breast protocol. But if it is a negative, that means it is irreducible. Then we can start the immediate breast protocol but with some caution and to, uh, to follow up the patient whether it is either the, the head is remains uh, in concentric reduction uh, or not so otherwise we, if there, this follow-up is poor we can go immediately by closed or open reduction so similarly this sort of uh, breast protocol can be done uh, within 44 months of age so ideal uh, ideal age of uh, starting treatment for this breast protocol is the four months in the for cerebral palsy, it is a four years. For the breast protocol for DDH, it is a four months. Basically, that uh, should not be that above six months, it cannot be done. So, a max highest limit of this breast protocol is the six months of age after birth. So, if the abduction is not restricted, then we can do the Burler's test. So, Burler's test is a provocative test, and that if it is positive, that is dislocatable, we can immediately start the breast protocol. But if it is a negative, then again, we can do the Burlos maneuver. So basically both are almost same in Burlos maneuver. Or the, we can give some little bit much more pressure to dislocate it by adduction. So if it is, again, it is it is positive, that is dislocatable, we can immediately start the breast protocol. Uh, but if it is a negative, that means it is an either normal or dysplasia, then we can repeat the clinical radiological screening after three to six months. So this is the treatment of choice for suspect, suspected DDH. And, but if the uh, follow-up period follow-up, that means I believe clinically, if that is a patient is uh, recovering this good abduction without any restriction, or there is a radiologically there is a concentrated reduction where the femoral head uh, is directed towards the triradiate cartilage, 
that means it is, it is growing well, then there is a favorable uh, follow up. Then we can do the cluster immobilization. So, this is the you know, protocol. Cluster immobilization can be done either with, uh, actually by 90 degree uh, abduction, 45 degree, uh, 90 degree flexion, 45 degree abduction, and neutral rotation for at least six weeks, followed by the, uh, the, the mobilization. So, this is the protocol. Now, this in this context, there is another uh, we can discuss. Suppose this is the uh, photograph, and uh, the question is asked identify the orthosis, how many straps and functions, and of the straps, ideal age and the candidate, call up and the devices and the complications. So, I already said uh, all, all our questions are, are discussed in this manner. It is a, it is a public harness. So, basically, it is the anterior strap and the posterior strap, anterior strap for the flexion, for, contra, for making the flexion of the hip which is done at least 90 degree, nine, not more than 120 degree, because that can lead to uh, femoral nerve palsy. In the posterior strap is basically for the abduction, which should be done at least 45 to 60 degree, not more than that. Ideal is already done. It is it is four to six months of age, and candidate is already, it is discussed, there is those who are barlow positive and the autorally positive. And if there is autolony negative, that means that is dislocated but irreducible, then we can start within four years of age, but with a caution. So we have to do very much uh, cautious, that is follow up. That is if we, if we add, apply it, immediately after application, at least after two days, we have to within 48 hours we have to check it, whether the patient is complaining of severe pain or not. Because pain can happen because of the impingement of the femoral head against the acetabulum. So we have to reduce the abduction and the flexion. So first follow-up is two days, followed by at least one, one weekly or two if you have to examine till it is completely reduced or not, we have to check within three to six weeks. It's not more than, if it is not uh, reducing within three, uh, three weeks, you have to discard it. So the, what are the complications? There are several complications like there is a posterior vestibular root or the infeeder, so as you can see here, so this is a well, this is this is a before application and this is after application as you can see here. So this is a triadiate cartilage and the, the, the femoral head is uh, is looking inferiorly. So there is an inferior uh, inferior dislocation or subluxation occurring with the public harness and then similar. See this how much flexion it is much more flexion is almost more than one twenty degree that can lead to femoral nerve palsy. So in every follow up you have always checked whether the baby is able to extend the knee or not. So if the knee extension is lacking, then there is a possibility of femoral nerve palsy we have to take care of. So this is the questions usually asked. Now, this is the another question usually given in the DNB. So it is a 35 years old man had road traffic accident and injury to the west and is unable to walk and swelling on the right thigh. As you can see here, swelling on the right thigh. Now, which is being shown? So what is the possibility? Which is which clinical, which is the clinical test, which investigation to be done for confirmation of the diagnosis, and how can it be treated? So, uh, dear friends, that you can easily understand. So, this is a basically is a soft tissue swelling, as you can see here. This is a large, diffuse swelling, soft tissue swelling. And see in the, this test, it is basically it is a cross fluctuation test. So, so I didn't think the lesion, that is a moral level lesion. So, name of that is the cross fluctuation test, differential diagnosis. Basically, it's a post-traumatic injuries, as you can see here, like the fat necrosis, coagulopathy related hematoma, and really the post-traumatic early stage myositis ossificans with diffuse subcutaneous edema. Now, which investigations? So basically, it's a, it's a moral revelation. A, see, once you this why I have I have given this, this uh, this feeling is extremely important. As a Maurice Morel level, and as a French surgeon, he, he had identified this. In 1853, so the spelling is extremely important, and if you unless you write this uh, proper spelling, you will not get the uh, full marks. So this is basically very basically important. Basically, it is a post-traumatic close degloving injuries occurring in the subcutaneous plane. Now, which investigation MRI is the modality of the choice because the, by MRI we can identify the lesion, and not only that, but we have to understand whether the lesion is caps encapsulated or not. If it is encapsulated, then simple uh, aspiration and conservative management is completely uh, refractory and there is a high chance of recurrence. So in that case, surgery is mandatory. If it is a not encapsulated, then we can try by the aspiration and compression bandage. So what are the other areas of developing this moral revelation? This is a trunk, lumbar, peripatellar, and the scapular lesion. Classification is done by the, uh, by the Melado and the uh, Ben Cardino. And the early surgical treatment is required. Otherwise, there's a high chance of infection and the skin necrosis. 
and the most important surgical treatment uh, and the and the important uh, uh, mainstay of the treatment the sclerodesis which is done with the help of the doxycycline or the absolute alcohol this is the classification i am not going to detail and this is the surgical uh, technique as you can see here this is this is the lesion and this is a uh, completely thoroughly evacuated and this is that absolute alcohol is being injected over there now this sort of questions is only asked uh, this sort of uh, radiograph is given and uh, given how to diagnose this how to approach such uh, cases so we have to un understand whether the baby is a dwarf or not if any 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 uh, photograph is given uh, like this uh, so, so yeah, like this so see this is a this is an adult person so this is a table that, and the baby is a 13 years old girl standing over this is a dwarf similarly this is also dwarf so you have to understand how to approach this you have to approach what the first question is whether the baby is the, the any picture is given with a dwarf baby or not so this is a dwarf is dwarfism if it's a dwarfism so it may be due to dysplasia group or it may be due to the metabolic metabolic disease so these are the two broad category and we have to choose which category we have to understand now next uh, point is deformity whether it's a single deformity or it's a multiple deformity so see in this case there is a multiple deformity as you can see here so this always again there are, again there are two diseases we have to understand whether it's a dysplasia group or it may be a case of metabolic disease now it is a multiple deformity now we have to check in the which part of the bone is involved suppose this is see this is the see, this is a metaphysis is involved the, the epiphysis is also involved as you can see here meta epiphysis and metaphysis both are involved so in this case the epiphysis and metaphysis is relatively normal but you know, see there are some some multiple deformities seen in the diaphysis see in the, in the multiple deformity here in the humerus in the distal part of the femur is see in the, in the proximal part of the femur in the distal part which is, is, is almost uh, in, in the process of healing so there's a multiple fracture so this is a case of multiple fracture so we have to identify it is a dwarf it's a single or multiple deformity we have to identify the location and and that and, uh, and whether the spine is involved or not so, so suppose that the spinal uh, uh videograph is given we have to check whether the spine is involved or not and lastly the hyperlaxity sometimes the clinical pictures are given uh, to, to, to see whether it is hyperlaxity or not so how to know that so, the, so, so basically it is a the developmental disorder the dysplasia it may be due to disorder of the cartilage and the bone growth it may be due to disease of the card cognitive tissue disorder it may be a disease the storage of the metabolic disorder or it may be due chromosomal disorder so if it is a, is a so if it is a disorder of the cartilage and bone growth so there is a abnormal structural abnormality of the epiphysis physis metaphysis metaphysis and diaphysis physis and metaphysis or combined if it is a connected to this disorder, so there is a generalized joint laxity like morphon, gelular tan loss, or stringency, imperfecta, hyperdysplasia, or sitting as progressive like this. If it is a storage disorder, so there is a possibility of correction of the uh, proteoglycans in mucopolysaccharides, there is a watchers, homocystra like this. So, the, in this way, this is, this is classified. Now, in the disorder of the cartilage and the bone growth, it may be involved the epiphysis, epiphysis, and metaphysis metaphysis and diaphysis and combined that is why it is extremely important which part of the bone is involved it is if it is only epiphysis is involved it may be commonly it is a multiple epiphyseal dysplasia so it that that, that usually involves both the peripheral joints as also the spine if it is epiphysis and metaphysis so there is a there is a high chance of deformity so there is a, there is a deformity, multiple deformity. It may be a deformity of the hip and knee. It may be flexion deformity of the hip, flexion deformity of the knee. And one case was given, there was a flexion deformity of the hip, flexion deformity of the knee, as also there is some genu valgum deformity. So multiple deformity and multiple deformity is possible in these two categories. It may be epiphysis and epiphysis and metaphysis group is a maximum deformity. In epiphysis group, it may be deformity, maybe there, but there may be basically it is a duo. Whether it's epiphysis and metaphysis group, there's a multiple deformity and this patient may be unable to stand and walk. So there are different types. There's a maybe hereditary multiple exostosis, achondroplasia, hypochondroplasia, metaphysial uh, chondrodysplasia, dyschondroplasia, and the oleo, that means the oleous disease. So these are the, uh, uh, the diagnosis. Metaphysial and diaphysis, there are several uh, the diseases. Uh, this is a relatively rare disease, but the combined and mixed, there is a um, nail patella syndrome, Glycogranate dysplasia, these are the causes. So, suppose this is the cases given. You can see here 
So in that case, you have to ask uh, what, how do you diagnose is the Baton score? What are the criteria of the Baton score? What is the, uh, the cutoff value for diagnosis of the hyperlaxity? There is a five. There are the different categories. That is the hyper extensibility of the elbow and the knee, where the patient is uh, able to keep the both the legs, both the uh, hands on the floor, keeping the knee straight, whether the, 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 the thumb can uh, touch the ulnar border. Okay. And there is um, uh, some um, some uh, whether the metacrophalangeal joint is extended at is uh, more than 90 degrees. So Baton score and see this is a, you can easily understand this is a hyperlaxity syndrome and you can see here the, the FICS the device is almost relatively normal. <clears throat> basically it is a arachnodactyly as you can see here. So basically it's a, a maybe a, a Marfan syndrome and if, a Marfan syndrome plus skin extensibility it is a it is the Ehlers Danlos syndrome. Okay, if it, if it is hyperlaxity plus Hyperlaxity of the joint plus skin hyperlaxity. It is a it is a ALR Danlos syndrome, and it is hyperlaxity plus there are some um, uh, recurrent dislocation, dislocation or subluxation. That is a Larsen syndrome. So in this way you can diagnose this. Now since you see this is a dwarf dwarf uh, girl. This is a thirteen years old girl. It's a very dwarf. As you can see here, the the see the the, the epiphysis metaphysis is it, it is a defective. But it is not so significantly defective. It may be either dysplasia or the metabolic disease. So if it is a metabolic disease, it is a, it is a, it is a it may be rickety. So in that case, it may be some. You can uh, have some uh, some either the the, the physial area may be wider, or it may be there is some uh, radio radio opaque area. There is a zone of provisional calcium. Both are absent. Instead of that, you can see the spine. You can see it is a platy spondyly. What is that platys spondyly? In platys spondyly, see the, this longitudinal diameter is very very less instead of the transverse diameter. In whole, throughout the throughout the body, is a, almost all of the vertebra. You can see here this transverse diameter. Even in the um, anteroposterior view and the lateral view, see the, this vertical height. Vertical height is less than the the, the horizontal height. So this is a basically it's a platys spondyly. So it is a basically it's a it is a metabolic disorder and see and see this uh, the line as you can see here the what is the this uh, this curve this uh, this uh, this arrow is suggesting of so this is a manuprosternal angle this manuprosternal angle is almost at a 90 degree so this is basically platys spondyly there is a dwarfism the multiple deformity and this is a manuprosternal angle 90 degree it is all suggest it is a it is a, it is a, a morco sport disease a mucopolysaccharidosis is type three, where there is a proteoglycans accumulate inside the bone and the marrow. Okay. Uh, now, if you see the radiograph of the spine, how do you diagnose this? See, this is the radiograph where the, the, the vertical height is almost it is maintained. Vertical height is maintained, but only there is some mild mild indentation in some areas where the vertical height is less. Whereas in the other vertical height, anterior and the posterior vertical height is almost maintained. So basically, here is the ring epiphysis is involved. So basically, it is a feature of the spondyloepiphyseal dysplasia. Whereas in the Morclo Bellsport disease, this is the extreme form of Morclo Bellsport, where the, the transverse diameter is almost equi equally reduced all over the the vertical height is equally reduced all over the vertebra, and the the, the transverse height is maintained. So basically, it is a it is a platy spondyle. Or vertebra plana or platy spondyly, and this is also see the the, the, the vertical height is reduced in uh, in comparison with the, uh, uh, the transverse side. This is a uh, support appearance. This is the typical vertebra plana, and this is the hurlers. Basically, both are a feature of the uh, mucopolysaccharidosis or the metabolic disorder. So, how to differentiate this? If as the mucopolysaccharidosis, there is an abnormal collection of the the degraded products. So, there is the bones are very soft. That is why it is it is transversely. It is flattened, whereas in the, the epiphyseal dysplasia, the only the ring epiphyses are involved. So in the vertebral plana, the, uh, the completely in the, in the whole in the whole part of the vertebral uh, body, the all areas the vertical height is reduced. Whereas in in the uh, in the ring in, uh, in, in the uh, on dysplasia group, only the area where the ring epiphyses are there, they are in that area the vertical height is reduced. That is how we can easily differentiate. And if there is some special feature, you can ideally easily identify. As you can see, this is a this is a blue sclera. Is ostriches is the perfecta, and this is the multiple neurofibromatosis. As you can see here, 
See, there's a multiple deformity, as you can see here, you can see and understand. And this is a basically it is a dysplasia group. And in this case, you see, this is the flexion deformity of the hip, knee. And, and, and say, because of the flexion depend for the hip and knee, patient is very, very uh, reluctant to walk as there is a tendency to fall <clears throat> along with that. And see, this is the, how many deformities are there? As you can see here, there's a kissing patella. There's a kissing patella, as you can see here, and this is the jello velgum deformity. So there's a high chance of increased internal antiversion. And, and so along with that, this, so there's a multiple deformity. So that may be a possibility of the uh, dysplasia group. And see, this, this is the radiograph of that lady. This is the metaphysial dysplasia. Now, this is another little bit uh, changing. We can uh, we are changing the topic. Uh, basically, this is a, a, a test. You can, it is a very relatively easier topic. And uh, now, uh, this, the patient is unable to extend the fingers, unable to extend the fingers, keeping the, uh, in, keeping the wrist torsiflex. Whether the, uh, when the wrist is flex, the whole the fingers can be easily Extended. So, what is the uh, name of the test? This is basically. Uh, can anybody tell? Can anybody can join this? Can anybody tell which type of test it is? Yeah, I think uh, no. Spender. Right. Sir, it's Volkmann's test. Volkmann's test. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the So, this is a Volkmann's test. Now, how it differs from normal tenodesis? Now, this is the maybe asked. This is a uh, maybe this uh, sort of question because normal tenodesis means if you can uh, all all of the students can examine by his own hand. So if we uh, flex the wrist, there is there, see there is a uh, so gradually there is extension of the fingers. So if we extend the wrist, there is a flexion of the uh, fingers. So this is basic uh, tenodesis. Effect. So how it differs from this? That means passively you cannot uh, actively and passively you cannot extend the finger uh, in case of uh, in, in, in keeping the wrist. Uh, wrist uh, dorsiflex. This is the difference. Now, how to check the intrinsic contracture? It may be associated with some flexion of the the so intrinsic contracture of the uh, of the fingers. So basically, this is done by the Bonnell Lipner test. So what is that? That can be asked. Now, uh, any can anybody answer these questions in this of this is a case of Volkmann ischemic contraction? So is is there a, any role of orthosis in this case? Can anybody tell? Try to answer this question. Yes. Um, sir, in, sir, in initial stage, stage one may be uh, working, sir. Another stage. No. Orthosis can be used. Uh, name the orthosis. Uh, pardon? No, sorry, sir. Wait, name the orthosis. So basically, this is a turn, but a turn one little test. Uh, so we have to testing the PIP flexion, keeping the MCP joint in extended and flexed. So if the, in the both the condition, the, the PIP joint cannot be flexed. That means it is a capsular contraction. But if the PIP joint can be flexed with the MCP flex, that is due to uh, intrinsic contraction. Now, this is the actual uh, orthosis. So uh, this is the dynamic VIC orthosis. There is a wrist, but I dynamic VIC wrist and orthosis. So basically, it is a torn buckle type of orthosis. So that can be used even before uh, apply before uh, surgery. So in that case, that will make your muscles relatively supple so that the, during the muscle slide operation, so there is a less, uh, less amount of surgical correction is required. Now, which sort of surgery? So these are the sort of, these are the surgeries, all of you know. So you have to write it down uh, for uh, getting the full marks. Now, this is the test is given in, a, in the last DNB. So, so patient is actually, this is a uh, patient is standing. And uh, test of uh, so basically all of you know this is a test of a some ligaments of the ligaments or the soft tissues of the around the knee. Now this now it is asked name the test. What is the significance and what are the other tests to diagnose the same? So can anybody try to do the answer? Patient is standing, keeping the leg externally rotated initially, and pay, ask, ask the patient to flex and extend. The knee again, keeping the knee, keeping the knee a little bit internally rotated, flex and extension. So basically, this is the age test, is weight bearing McManus test. So how it can be done? So if the knee should be kept in extension initially, and patient stands with the feet 30 to 40, 40 centimeter apart, depending on the meniscus, that means the lateral metal you are testing, the patient's feet are positions to allow either the maximum external rotation of the knee, which is done for the medial meniscus, and the maximum internal rotation of the knee is done for the lateral meniscus. So always ask the patient what half, half squatting, that is flexion, and then also again up to revert back to 
is normal position at its full length extension. So outcome, what is the outcome? That if the test, test is considered positive, when the pain is felt or the click is felt by the patient at the related site of the joint line at around 90 degree of the knee flexion. And uh, as anteriorly located, the meniscus tear produces the symptoms earlier in the knee flexion, whereas the tears located in the posterior horn of the meniscus produce the symptoms in the deeper knee flexion. So what are the other tests for diagnosis of the meniscus injury? Most sensitive test for diagnosis of the meniscus injury is the joint medial joint line tenderness for the medial meniscus, lateral joint line tenderness for the lateral meniscus. Another test is the MACMAR estimate. These are the uh, questions. Now, this is also given in your uh, DLP. The four years old boy has uh, had his deformity since childhood, uh, ever uh, even failed at the treatment. Now, identify the deformity. Now, can you, anybody try to identify this? Any, any, any person? <clears throat> what is the significance of this? What is the plan? How to counsel for treatment? And any role of conservative? And if it is surgery, which surgery to be done? Yes, I think Neeraj or Subhansu. It's, well, yeah. It is a uh, deformity of cavus equinus deformity. Yes. Uh, supi supination adduction deformity, sir. Most, uh, <clears throat> and uh, significance is... Uh, Sir, uh, abnormal gait, sir. Some uh, some creases are visible in the middle, so that may be a very resistant type of or syndromic variety. Sir, we have one answer. Syndromic CTEV, uh, sir. Yeah, neurogenic CTEV by Dr. Anand. Yes, very good. So, why it is neurogenic? Can anybody explain this? Yes, Anand, you can unmute yourself. Yes, it is a sign of it's a drop toe sign. As you can see here, there's a it is toe is great toe is dropped. Is plantar flexed, and if you if you try to dorsiflex, it is very difficult to dorsiflex, or it may be passively dorsiflex, actively cannot be dorsiflex. That means it's a drop toe sign. So basically, it is a drop toe sign. So it is a suggestive of it's a great toe plantar flex can be dorsiflex actively, but passive dorsiflexion is possible. <clears throat> so indicate the neurogenic deformity, as you can see here. So what is the management? So management should be uh, planting red foot. Uh, the play, uh, the food should be supple as much as possible. Yes. I think we've lost the. Yes, sir. I'll just audio. call him. What's happening? I'm calling him, sir. But he's not picking up him, maybe. Kept it silent. Yeah. Dr. Pal, we've Hello? lost you somewhere. You lost your yeah, audio somewhere. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Has it come? Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Uh, so, uh, aim is plan we have to do the plantigrade food. We have to make the food as supple as much as possible. We have to make painless and functional as much as possible. So, you have to counsel as the food may be plantigrade, uh, but maybe may not be supple and may become stiff after surgery. So, what are the options? So, options are basically it is a conservative, it is a ponsonity technique. Always have to start, always perform the supination, which makes some abduction possible so that the tissues are much more pliable and less surgical correction is possible. Now, if it is a surgery, it can be done by multiple osteotomy or uh, some orthodesis if it is a it is a mature food. Now, this is another case. is a 23 years old man with recurrent bleeding episodes. 
since childhood. Mm -hmm. It has had some deformity for last 12 years. So this is the adult type of uh, deformity, as you can see, aqua type of uh, equinus deformity. Uh, so identify the deformities. It is asked. Can anybody try to identify apart from this equinus deformity? There's some another deformity is added over there. Can anybody identify this? Uh, to drop to sir. No, it is drop to not not drop to. See the as you can lateral profile as you can see here. This is a metacor of uh, metatarsal phalangeal joint. They are hyper extended and hyper flexion of mallet to. Pardon? Mallet to sir. Mallet to is basically it is the acute flexion of the inter in, interphalangeal joint. But here they, there is a metatarsal of phalangeal hyper extended and there is hyper flexion of the inter interphalangeal joint. So basically in, it is a in, in, yes. Pardon? It is a clawing yes. of the toe. So along with the along, so clawing of the toes, so it is acquired type of uh, congenital telepathic, uh, acquired type of telepathic virus with clawing of the toes. So why do you, what is the cause of that? What is the cause? Can anybody now, this is already hint is given, there is a recurrent bleeding episode. So if it is a recurrent bleeding episode inside that, so that can lead to mm -hmm. some compartment syndrome and that can lead to intensive muscle contraction and that can lead to this sort of uh, the clawing of the toes. Now, which investigation to be done? So investigation basically is have to check the factor eight antibodies. So factor eight antibodies. So basically it is acquired telepathy equinoperal with clawing and, and callus due to injury due to hem failure, hemophilia. So basically it is a, you have to do the investigation is you have to check the factor eight antibodies. Why it is important? Because if there is a no fresh bleeding, that means it's a less antibody. So in that phase, we have to do the operation. So it is a 23 years old man. So we can offer the triple arthrodesis under cover of the factor eight. But if there is a chance of uh, factor eight antibodies are more, so it can fail. So that is why we have to check the concentration of the factor eight antibodies. Now, this yeah, is also given. Pardon? Uh, excuse me, sir. Sir, maybe we'll take some question in between so that. OK, OK. It's, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll come up. Sir, so the last, can... yeah, the last one, what you have shown, if it is a rheumatoid, then that one is buttonhole deformity. Right? Right? So right? in that, that toe, close, that claw close. toe, if it is a rheumatoid case, that can be buttonhole deformity, right? Butonia, butonia deformity. Butonia deformity, yes. Butonia. Butonia. Yeah. Yes, that that is a possibility. But see, I have the hint is given as it is photograph is taken from the side. There is a hyper extension of the metatarsophalangeal joint. So basically, this is the claw. So basically, what is happening in the hand? The same thing is happening to the foot. As the hint is given, there is a recurrent bleeding episode. So that is a, that is the hint they have to be pick it take. So why the the, the more, actually the the idea of this class is how to uh, how to uh, how to take the hints. For diagnosis, that is most important. Yes, yeah. so, uh, there was one question, sir. Uh, in this year, they have asked about a uh, 22 year old CTV in the OSCE, what uh, the, our DNV candidate has given, and they have asked about uh, the causes and the prevention in that one. Maybe, sir, so, that is why the last case I have shown this. That is almost same same type of uh, uh, case I have shown this. So basically, the cause is the cause is the persistence of the deformity. It may be neurogenic cause, it may be osteogenic cause. The cause is already there. So if it is a suppose that is a spinal dystrophism. So if it is not treated for the long period, that can easily ref, uh, easily uh, recur. So that is why the, even after the pulsatory technique, it fails because of the part. The cause is not uh, taken care of. That is the most important. Or there is a recurrent hair bleeding. So this sort of primary cause, if it is it is present, so that has to be taken care of. Otherwise, the the the, the, the defects are the secondary. So if we treat the secondary deformity without treating the primary one, that will not happen. So prevention is we have to we have to prevent from initially from uh, from childhood. Okay, that is the main. Uh, I think what you need to do there is to classify the different types of clubfoot, like an idiopathic clubfoot, the reason would probably be inadequate treatment. While in arthrogryposis and in the neurogenic uh, club feet, sometimes in spite of good treatment, they can recur. Okay, Because with the neurological problem, there will be a tendency for it to recur. 
because of an unequal muscle pull. Yeah. And prevention would be by adequate treatment and bracing. Huh? So if it's a recurrence, then bracing, if it is no, not a flat. It's, it's not a treatment for brace, uh, recurrence. Mm. Bracing is only after the foot is corrected to maintain correction. Okay. Yes, sir. Another uh, question was, sir, one week old humerus fracture with radial nerve injury. And what is the role of electrodiagnostic study? This is the first part. Another one is, will you explore the radial nerve in the treatment? This was second asked. Part. In the second so, part. Uh, will you explore the radial nerve during a fixation of the fracture? This is the second part of the question. First, I can't get that. Is it given in the chat box? Uh, sir, I'll just repeat it. Sir, this is one week old humerus fracture with radial nerve palsy. So will you... Of diagnosis, that is one. Yeah. Second. Will you second explore one? the nerve during the fixation okay. of the fracture? Okay, okay, okay. During the fixation of the fracture. So how much old, old is it is? How much old? One week. Fracture. One week. So one I think, week. I think the... I think the answer should be pretty clear for this. Uh, so one week old injury, you would treat the fracture for what it is. There's no point doing neurodiagnostic tests at one week firstly. Yeah. Okay. So you would, because you're not going to get any sensible response from that. Second thing is you treat the fracture as you would treat, the consensus is you would treat the fracture as you would treat a fracture. Uh, whether it had a nerve injury or not. Third thing is when you, do you explore it or not? That is a question of debate. There are some people who feel you should explore it and others who say you don't need to explore it. I think what you're doing, if you're doing an open reduction, you will be making sure that the nerve is not entrapped in the fracture. Okay, that's important. But whether you go looking to explore it will depend on the approach you use for that fracture. So if you're doing a posterior approach, then you have to identify the nerve anyway. Okay. If you're doing a anterior approach or MIPO approach, then you may not identify the fracture. Okay, you may, may not identify the nerve. So I think it varies. the answer has to be um, sort of uh, say, say that the and the exploration depends on the type of treatment you are planning for the patient. Absolutely agree. So exactly, I agree. So that is I mean, my uh, practice. My answer should be: if it is a sharp humerus with radial nerve palsy uh, in one week, there is no role of radio as you have uh, rightly mentioned. But uh, we have to choose the approach. So in that case, uh, we have to choose the posterior approach just to check whether the nerve is entrapped or not. There is no question of nerve. Uh, 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 there, uh, there is exploration in, in case of fresh fracture. So, but if it is a six weeks, six okay, weeks you. old, now the question was given that is a, if it is six weeks old, what is the role of electrodiagnosis? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I'm telling what is the role of electrodiagnosis in case of any nerve injury? Now, what happens if it is any nerve injury? That is a possibility of uh, neurotmesis, uh, uh, neuropraxia, axonomesis, or neurotmesis. But if it is a uh, neuropraxia, it usually recovers within two to three weeks. So we have to wait for two to three weeks. So there is a no role of uh, no electrodiagnostic study before two to three weeks. So after three weeks, if there is a no uh, recovery, then we have to check again the whether they have to uh, whether there is any uh, recovery signs of recovery or not. So at least we can wait another three weeks. So, so, so why? Because if the nerve is cut, so initially there is some valerian degeneration occurs in the distal part and in the proximal part, there is some retrograde degeneration. And it starts recovering by the, by, by uh, if it is, a, it is, a, it starts recovering from two to three weeks or not. Otherwise, if, from two to three weeks onwards, there is a chance of depolarizing potential it starts to develop. So if, if you want to do the electromyography, that should be done either three weeks or another uh, three weeks, so the plus six weeks. So we can wait for six weeks. After six weeks, we can check with the electrodiagnostic study, whether it's a depolarizing potential uh, is uh, coming or not. Or if it is recovering, there is a polyphasic potential will come. 
So that is the uh, role of electromagnetic diagnosis study at six weeks. So this is very important. This is this question usually it is asked in the last uh, uh, exam. So what is the role of uh, electrodiagnostic study at six weeks or twelve weeks? So basically to check whether it is now is uh, it is already damaged. So if there is a depolarizing potential is still present at six to twelve weeks, that means it is either a axonot masses or a neurot masses. So so uh, so so in that case we have to check this the spreading tunnel sign or there are some uh, some some motor recovery or not. Uh, or if it is a polyphasic uh, potential is already coming, that means it is a recovery impulse. So another important structure, you have to check the F reflex. You have to check the F reflex also. Sometimes, so there is associated uh, injury in the proximal part. That means sometimes a spinal cord injury. So, uh, so there is some avulsion of the root from the spinal cord. So along with that, so some, uh, some signs of peripheral uh, nerve palsy. So in that case, how do you differentiate whether it is due to peripheral nerve palsy or it is a very central lesion? So in that case, the role of electrodiagnosis, electrodiagnosis study can also tell whether it, 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 there is a F-reflex is present or not. If the F-reflex is present, that indicates uh, that that usually suggests though there is a chance of high, uh, high injury. So in that case, we have to make the MRI or the contrast MRI to check whether it is a root injury, it is a uh, the post ganglionic or pre ganglionic, -ganglionic injury. So that the, the, the neurosurgical intervention may be required. Another important investigation in this juncture, I just want to highlight there is a high frequency ultrasonography. This high, high frequency ultrasonography is used. So once there is a no recovery is occurring within six to six weeks to twelve weeks down the line. So in that case, high frequency ultrasonography is required to check for the exact uh, level of the lesion of the nerve. Sometimes there's a neuroma or the fibrosis that can also be taken care of, uh, usually picked up with the help of the high frequency ultrasonography. So that is the, these are the usual questions asked in the examination. So ultrasound can also be useful in the initial stages to look for either entrapment or las uh, nerve laceration, okay? Because these are the only two conditions where you may need to do a urgent exploration is if you know that the nerve is lacerated or you know that the nerve is entrapped. And ultrasound is one way of uh, you being uh, sort of telling you that it is there. Unfortunately, uh, this is uh, fairly observer dependent and uh, the, the overall the ultrasound uh, uh, the radiologists doing the ultrasound are not yet able to give us a very good uh, answer to this, although now there are a number of papers in the literature talking about it. Yeah. So, uh, one question, sir, about they have asked, they have given the image and they asked what, uh, what the implant it is. They have shown LCDCP. Uh, Actually, in this exam, they have asked LCDCP, LCP, cancellous screw, as well as DHS, the four implants. The About the LCDCP, they asked uh, how many screw we should put uh, around the, means on each side, uh, although the person who has given the question, they have not written the name of the bone and the indication and the definition as well. That depends on the bone. Dependence case that depends on the bone. So radius, I think, uh, I think that the radius at, at least uh, six cortices, six cortices on both the sides. On the humerus, there are almost seven, eight cortices on the both the side of the fracture. Like this, there are different. That depends on the bone. So, so even long. if they haven't mentioned the bone, you can mention it and say, and if you are doing the humerus, we would need four screws on each side, minimum yeah. of four. Uh, and in uh, the radius, it's usually a minimum of three screws, uh, but it would vary on the fracture pattern, etc. Okay, so it's not uh, uh, absolute uh, this thing. Okay, and type uh, of a screw also, sir. So LCDCP has only one type one. of screw. Okay? Yeah, I think there is no. The LCP lock. has locking and conventional screws. Okay, so the LCDP is the DCP is all conventional screws. Okay, sir. Absolutely. Okay, sir. And uh, so the type, if, type of screws doesn't come in there. Okay, so you have mentioned once that LCDCP has not come to India, probably. Of course, no, no, it was there for many years before we. Yes, some, it was practice. Okay, so there for many years before the LCP came. Okay, sir. So uh, about the principle of application of DHS, they have asked, as well as uh, 
about the so i think yeah. principles of application of dhs everyone should know i don't think we need to yeah. uh, question that question i think it's a very yes, it's a very straightforward question which uh, no one should be complaining about yes sir and uh, they but have some controversies also coming that means in a dhs uh, there can leads to some uh, compression that compression that means dynamic compression so yeah. that, that may lead to reduction of the uh, the the, uh, the length of the liver arm for the abductors so that can lead to the there is there is some uncontrolled or um, at least more than 1 cm compression that is more than 1 cm reduction of the liver arm or the abductor liver arm that can lead to abductor enlargement so, so in fact, the recently there's a big, there's a big trial known as the Insight trial, which is a, a multi-centered, uh, randomized, uh, prospective trial comparing DHS and the nail, and they found that the nail has no real advantage over the DHS. Okay. Yeah. So it's called the Insight trial. Yes, uh, the last one, sir, which I should mention that uh, they have asked about pelvic bone anatomy other than that they asked to about the osteotomies of the pelvic bone they have not named any but uh, probably they have in, asked what to enumerate about yeah, the so i think you, you you should go by according to the age no? starting with salter then pemberton dega going on to uh, where you are so also in terms of you can call it a reshaping osteotomy or a reorientating osteotomy. Okay. Sir. Or the last is a, a salvage, which is where you do something like a chiari. Yeah? Okay. You have a shelf and chiari, which are salvage procedures. Okay. And then you have the children and the adults. So in the adults, once the triradiate cartilage has fused, then you have to do either a steel or a uh, Gans type of osteotomy, a very acetabular or so triple. Yes, so I think those are questions which people should have a reasonable idea of to once they are sitting for the exams. Okay, I think uh, Matt, you got something else for us? No, sir. Uh, just one thing, sir, because uh, usually in any center, the examination is for two to three days, so probably they are getting different questions for uh, each batch. So that is also important. So there are anything yeah. can yes, be yes, but we uh, have to understand the uh, how to crack the OSPI. So we have to understand what is the motor. So but there are several pictures that are given. So, so you have to pick which pictures. So that was given. There is a one uh, hand uh, radiograph of the hand. Fine. So there, if there is spinal uh, deformity is there. So if once you have got the spinal deformity, you have to understand it may be either dyspepsia or the meta or the metabolic disease. So like this. So if it is a dyspepsia, it may be due to the some different epiphyseal dyspepsia, spinal epiphyseal dyspepsia, like this. So how to think? How to channel your channelize your uh, thinking process? This is extremely important. The one uh, one uh, one. Uh, uh, one uh, case was given. So there is a uh, swelling on the uh, in, uh, in in front of the elbow, and there is an ulnar deviation. Ulnar deviation of the. Okay, we have lost. Probably osteochondroma or something. Yes, sir. I have. Okay, sir. We have lost, sir. So. I think we should. Uh, anyway, it's time to close. So. Yes, sir. Let's see if we just wait for a minute. So it calls. This must be unstable. Yeah, I'll... Okay, sir. Uh, hello. 
Yes, sir. So, just yeah, I think uh, looks like there are some yeah. That is, okay, that is sure. uh, just I want to highlight that is the how to pick up the exact uh, hints. Suppose so there is a one uh, swelling over there in front of the elbow, and there is an alert deviation. So we have to under we have to think of uh, is it in a childhood injury? Childhood injury is, is uh, it is since from the childhood. So it is alert deviation from the wrist from since childhood. So there is either possibility of some uh, some trauma which it can lead to some dislocation or it's ulnar so it's a long time that may be due to some uh, inflammatory conditions. Inflammatory condition is ulnar division of the wrist. The inflammatory condition in other side of the wrist along with some uh, some uh, swelling in the elbow that means the, some uh, uh, bursa uh, that may be inflammatory disorder. So, but in that case, there may, if the, the elbow movement, the movement should be significantly restricted in any inflammatory condition. But in that case, it was seen the elbow movements are, are almost full. So, so there is a possibility of uh, either some developmental disorder so that may be related with some uh, multiple osteochondroma uh, affecting yeah. the distal part of the uh, which can lead to some. Uh, the... So, I think uh, uh, Dr. Pal, your internet is very unstable. So, yes, we'll sir. call it a day. It's already eight o'clock. So, yes, thank sir. you very much, everybody, and thank you, Professor Pal, uh, for yes, your sir. excellent sir, presentation. Yeah. And, Thank you. Uh, your yeah. internet is so, giving you a lot of problems, so we will call, call it a day. And uh, good night, everybody. Until next week. Thank you. Uh, we'll discuss we'll again. again. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you. you very much, sir. Yes, sir. So.